All right, John, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Jason. It's uh, it's round two, three. I don't know. We've we've done this with each other a couple of times now, uh, so it's fun fun to be back. Yeah, I think the last time you were on, we were talking about your adventures at altitude because you had spent a couple months, I think, at around ten thousand feet, and that might have been episode one eighty something. Yeah, so that would have been twenty twenty one. Um, which is a pair, if you do the math, is two years ago, which is crazy. Yeah, and here we are. Um, you know, I've already given you an intro in the beginning of the pod, but I, I wanted to hear your version. So I'm going to ask you what you usually ask your guests on your podcast: Who is John Levitt? Who is John Levitt? I so yes, I ask this question on my podcast, and uh, the reason I do that is because I got lazy with doing intros and wanted other people to do it for me by asking them who they are but then as i started doing that it it gives a really interesting look into how somebody thinks about themselves because sometimes people say oh i'm a runner i'm a this i'm a that and then other times it's like a three to four minute answer like this one's turning out to, <laughs> to be but um uh at surface level i like to run i like to bike i like to be outdoors um i live here in boulder I'm a curious person, and that has enabled me to also have a podcast talking about um, running and the, the mental aspect of the sport. Um, my day job, I work at Inside Tracker, a longtime supporter of the Strength Running podcast. You've been a great partner. Um, so thank you to the, the listeners who have helped to make that a strong partnership. Um, and I just like helping people. I like the process of getting better. I like the process of connecting. I like the uh, the feeling of helping people feel like they belong. Um, and through the podcast platform, through social, et cetera, and, and in person, as we'll talk about today, um, I, uh, in, I, I get to do all those things. Yeah, you sure do. And I would say that you're actually quite good at them. Your one of your superpowers is the ability to connect people and almost create a community around yourself. And so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you. Um, first, hold on a second. Did you go for your run yet today? What did that look like? I did. I did soft hour. <laughs> there were 40 people there. Talk about community. Um, I was, uh, I did a, a hill workout yesterday. So I was very much uh, caboosing it today. Um, and yeah, we did seven-ish miles uh, at Teller Farms. So nice, nice soft dirt. Now, what is soft hour? Because I think those people in the Boulder scene know what soft hour is. It's kind of become this fixture. Um, it also just has a fun name to it. But for, for those who don't know, what is soft hour? Yeah, fun name and fun logo with the ice cream cone. Um, Soft Hour was started by Brian Schroy as part of the track club as a way to create a sense of community around the different teams here in Boulder. Um, he noticed that a lot of people had easy runs on Wednesdays, and it was a good way to connect different groups um, so that everybody could run for an hour, easy effort, chat about whatever, and then you're on your way. And it's like a it's it's a bit of a misnomer because it's soft running for people who run marathons in the like 215 to, to sub 3 range so soft for that crew is you know I ran 825 pace and I was I was at the back of the pack today um but it's soft hour for or it's soft and easy for um you know, these, these sub elite or elite teams here in Boulder and, and started as a way to connect them. And as it's grown, um, it's grown to more, you know, everyday runners. Um, and there's been some talk of introducing pace groups and, um, making it even more inclusive. Yeah. It's a really interesting concept, I think. Um, because number one, it's, it's sort of taking all these disparate groups and, and giving them an opportunity to come together and, 
you know, enjoy the sport of running in, in a way that is is inclusive to to most of those people. Totally. Um, plus, it's just it's just a great way to get anybody, regardless of whether you're on one of these, you know, really impressive Boulder area running teams, to get together and go for an easy run. Uh, I want to come back to soft hour because I think this is a really interesting concept. You know, one of the big themes today is community. I want to explore today how anybody can create a community of supportive athletes around themselves. And John, I think you have done exactly this. You moved to Boulder a couple of years ago, and now I consider you to be like the mayor. You're like, in my mind, you are the mayor of Boulder. When I have a Boulder question, I go to you. Uh, can you briefly describe the, the running scene in Boulder? Because uh, I think you're uniquely set up to do that. You know, like, what's it like? You know, what, what's like a typical week in Boulder as a runner look like? So picture, picture a race atmosphere, and that's just like a Saturday morning at Tom Watson parking lot, right? So Boulder, I don't know how many people live here, but there are thousands of people who run here. And I, I bridge the line between road and trail. So if I'm out on the trails you know, you're seeing hundreds of people out there. If you're running road long runs, as we've done together up in North Boulder out of Tom Watson, you're running into Emma Coburn's group. You're running into Tin Man. You're running into all these Olympians and elites. And by the way, the triathletes are whizzing by on their on their bikes and making that beautiful whir sound that we've, <laughs> we've talked about. I love that sound. It's wonderful. It's one of my favorites. It's wonderful. And... It's just such like a – the best way I can describe it is it's a playground, right? Everywhere you go, there's someone doing something. On the terrain, um, there are tons of groups. Um, I run out at Bobo, which is a um, soft you know, crushed gravel or dirt path. It's 5K and uh, in one direction. And you, know, you go out there, and on the other end near Marshall – road you have team boss doing their mile reps down marshall road and it's just like there are people everywhere and then so you have the high end of the sport where everywhere you look there are olympians and then you have you know grandma out there who's crushing it at 80 years old and could probably drop you on her bike and <laughs> and it's just like this you see people 30 40 50 years your senior just out there doing it. When we did one of our last 5K time trials up out of left hand, we met a bunch of dudes that were in their 70s. And, you know, they were plodding along and, and you know, they're like, oh, ha, ha, you know, you're passing a bunch of old geezers, like must, must feel nice, like jokingly, of course. Um, and we said to them, like, you guys are living the dream, right? You're 70 something years old. And you've you've been running for sixty years. That's that's aspirational. And so you have these people that you know. You show up to a group run. There's a two hundred nine, two eleven marathoner, and there are also seventy year olds. We had a a sixty nine year old come to three of our five Ks, and you know she ran thirty minutes and she was last every single time, but she was out there doing it. And so I find that this, like, no matter your pace, no matter how many Olympics you've been to, or if it's your first, you know, month of running ever, like, there are people out there doing that. And so we've talked road. Okay, now you go to the trails, and, you know, the trailheads are packed at 730 in the morning here. And it's it's pretty impossible to be out on the trails by yourself, which – for me as someone who's afraid of wildlife is wonderful. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, you know, you go out and it's like, again, it's like a playground. If you need hill reps, there are places to do long extended hills. If you, if you need big vert, you can run, you know, straight up rattlesnake gulch like we did this past weekend. And you're up at 7,000 feet looking at, um, looking at, uh, the continental divide, right? Like, there's something for everyone and there's everything for everyone. And if it sounds, if this sounds, you know, too good to be true, come out here and check it out and then hit up Lauren Daniels when you're ready to buy a house. 
she'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just the idea that there's something for everyone it certainly rings true. And, and I got to say that it is definitely surreal just to be like out on a run in Boulder. And then all of a sudden, Emma Coburn runs by us with a couple of her team boss teammates or like when we were doing one of those five caves. Yeah, Emma Bates. Was, right. I think it was late March and Emma Bates comes flying by doing like 24 miles at low six minute mile pace. And you're just like, oh, I am here with some of the best runners in the world. And I get to just see them out on their training runs and they're dealing with the same weather that I'm dealing with. I just love being in the same environment as these impressive athletes. But I'm really glad that you talked about the inclusivity of the community because it's certainly intimidating to start thinking about, oh, I'm gonna go for a group run and there's going to be the top American at the Boston Marathon on this group run with me. That is, is almost by definition intimidating, especially with running where it's so objective, right? Like your pace is your pace, your finish time is your finish time. And, and it's very easy to measure yourself against other runners, but there's really not too much of that. And, and that's actually quite refreshing in my mind. You know, you can find a group, you can find uh, other runners to run with and, and your pace is, is almost doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing for us to say, you know, if we drop ourselves in any other city, we're towards the front of a pack, but here we're very solidly in the middle. Um, I think it, it depends on the group, right? Like there are certain places where that's true. And then they're like, you show up to a, I mean, the great thing with the track workout is that it doesn't really matter and you can be within the same, you're, you're never more than 400 meters away from the rest of the group. Um, there are definitely groups that fit different goals and objectives. Um, Rocky Mountain Runners is a group that's, you know, all encompassing. Um, you show up there and, you know, Claire Gallagher, winner of Western States, is out there jogging with people who are going for their first trail run. She does events with Patagonia um, through the group, through their store. And, you know, it's the same thing. Scratch hosts group runs out of their store. Um, so you have all these options of, of places to go and that it's like, Boulder, Flagstaff, San Francisco, Boston, New York, like these meccas of road or trail or both where there are just so many options. And so, yeah, it's it, like try out a bunch of them and see what sticks. Now, how often do you personally go running with others? Because you are someone that runs as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you run six or seven days a week, right? Yeah, I run six days a week six days a week, and you are trying to do most of your runs with other people. Uh, does that include workouts too? Um, the workouts are often a little harder to line up um, with friends. Um, but yeah, like on an ideal week, I'm running with friends four, four times a week. I think I give, so Friday is my easiest day. Um, and shortest day. And that's the day where I feel I should run by myself because that's how I allow my body to dictate the pace and the effort. Um, but for all the other ones, yeah, I love, I love running with people and when it's possible to do as part of a workout, that's wonderful. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And this brings up a really interesting point. It's, it, it's this balance between, you doing training that's appropriate for you. And then of course, embracing running community, finding new friends and, and really uh, investing in existing friendships by going on runs together. You know, how do you balance that? You know, doing training that's right for you versus going on runs with athletes who might be a lot better than you or, or who just might be doing things that you know, you could do, but maybe you shouldn't do. How do you strike that balance? So I had it. So my coach is David Roche, and we had an interesting conversation on this recently. He's like, your RPE, rate of perceived exertion, modulates way more than most people when I run with other people. So I am objectively able to run harder 
at an easier effort when I when I run with friends. Um, I don't know why this is. I don't know why I get such a boost that's like more than right because this is a studied phenomenon. It's not it's not novel. But his observation was I improve more than most when running with other people, and so I use that to my advantage. Right, like many of my running partners are Olympians or professional athletes who could could drop me hard uh, in a workout and have, um, but I run easy days with them and sometimes the easy lines up perfectly and sometimes it doesn't. But one of David's comments about my training lately is that I've been running a lot of just under sub eight miles and for a professional athlete, you know, 745 easy pace is like a jog and, and that's what they should be doing in heavy training. For me, at what I've been doing lately, that's that's the perfect stimulus for what I need. Um, and I'm not saying I'm you know doing the same easy run as a professional athlete in heavy training, although sometimes I am with with Gwen. But like Kara Goucher, for example, she could she could run 20 miles a week and still be like stupid fit. Um, I can't do that, and when I run with her, our efforts are roughly similar, um, but I get such a boost out of running with other people, and particularly running with other people who have a lot of knowledge and, like, either – so I, I, I do a lot of um, – figuring stuff out on the run with Kara, for example. And I've gone through my own experience with ups and downs with running lately. And I look at someone like her as a role model or um, a mentor with how to, how to deal with stuff. And so when in that environment, it, I'm like completely not thinking about pace um, it's conversational effort, but it's like it's quick, um, and it's it's conversational, but it's it's an appropriate stimulus. Then there's someone like Hayden Hawks, who is lining up for Western States um, in an attempt to win that hundred mile race, and I can't run with him in his first run of the day, but we've done a lot of running together this season, where he did a you know an eighteen mile workout in the morning. And then we're doing eight miles together in the afternoon. And so for him, he's looking to slow down and I'm looking to speed up. And so with him, I, you know, I go anywhere between 7.15 to 8 uh, to 7.45. And that's like up tempo easy for me, or as I like to call it, fast casual, like a Chipotle run. Um, <laughs> and again, that's that's a stimulus that in this period of, of training is appropriate for me and it's it's recovery effort for him so the first time we ran together uh it was eight miles at 714 pace he had just moved to boulder my heart rate was like 165 and his was like 130 <laughs> and so he was jogging and i was i was not um and for a while i was using that run as like a weekly moderate ish effort which you know if i were in heavy training that would perhaps not be appropriate and and be too far into the gray zone of not easy but not hard um but what i love about this place is that like there's there's someone for everything um and like i have friends that i call on if i if i know i want to go slow i call you i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> well done, John. That was good. <laughs> um, and and I have friends who I call on if I know I want to go fast, or like Kara has joined for a lot of my workouts this year because she's not she's not training, but um, it's pretty easy to get her to to push. And she's at a place where we're pretty aligned in terms of of uh, fitness. Um, again, if she if she trained for like a month, it would be a different story. Um, 
but yeah, very long answer to your question of how do I balance? I think your question, you know, 10 minutes later was balancing the, all the different people and, and group runs and, and this and that. And I think back to when I used to visit Boulder, I would come here for seven to nine days. And I remember one of the trips I ran 72 miles over that eight or nine day stretch. And I ran two miles solo, just two. <laughs> and, and I was so injured when I got back from that trip because I just did everything. I raced Boulder Boulder. I did the Manitou Incline with Zach Miller two days later. I did a November Project workout the same day as the Incline. Um, and it was like stuff as much into uh, that that trip as possible. And when I first moved to Boulder uh, in 21, I had to remind myself that like I wasn't going home in a week. And that I, I could go for runs by myself and I could eat meals by myself um, because I didn't need to stuff everything in. And sometimes I, I need that reminder again um, to sort of dial it back with trying to do everything. Um, but long story short, I, I love running with other people, as you've noticed. Um, we've shared a lot of miles together at this point. And it's just fun, right? Like, this is now why I do it. And my fitness goal is, like, be fit enough to do fun adventures with friends and have it not suck. And, and like, don't get destroyed by hour two. That's a good goal, John. I, li I like that goal. Yeah, I, I, I just can't help but think about my upbringing through cross country and track because I was introduced to the sport as a team sport and I almost never went running alone for the first eight years <laughs> of my running career, you know, with except with ex some exceptions, of course, you know, weekend runs and some runs over the summer when you're doing some base training for cross country. But I could not have done the workouts that I have done in my life. I could not have run the races that I have run in my life without the support of all those people around me. And I think you can look at it from both a performance perspective and this perspective of just surrounding yourself by friends and having a lot of fun. Totally. You know, on the one hand, you should do that because I think you get more out of the sport. It's more fun. You just you know, build a better community that's there to support you. And on the performance side, it's also going to have the great side benefit of helping you strive forward and make more progress with your running. Uh, you know, I was joking around with a, a friend of mine who lives on the East Coast. You know, he was a winner of the New England 10K Division Three, So he's a, he's a very talented runner. And we were kind of joking around about how it would be so hard to train for some short middle distance race at this point in our lives because we don't have the team. It's so difficult to do some of these really challenging track workouts that, you know, if you're training by yourself, it's just virtually impossible. You might as well just train for a marathon, do a lot of volume. The workouts are a little bit more manageable to do by yourself. And it's just this really interesting way of thinking about performance, but then also just thinking about longevity in the sport, which is something that I'm becoming more and more interested in, you know, with those, that group of older runners that you mentioned that we saw at the trailhead, I remember looking over at you and being like, dude, is that going to be us in, in 30 years? And, and we were all like, I hope so. That's the dream, right? I just want to be out doing some trails with my buddies, you know, every weekend for the next 40 years. That would be the ultimate dream. Totally. So to your point, um, yesterday, Sarah Vaughn, a uh, professional uh, marathoner posted, is anyone doing a track workout tomorrow? Um, because she wanted to link up with people so that even if they weren't doing the same workout, she could have company at the track because it's easier when there are other people there. Um, and that's just the perfect epitome of, of what you just said. And, and yeah, those guys at, um, at the trailhead, like, Yes, definitely the goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and they were also like, they were also like rocking short shorts and, and like joking around about being slow. And, and that's exactly like the mindset that I want to have at that age. 
Like, yes, I'm still going to wear the split leg short shorts <laughs> and just fully embrace that aspect of running. But then also just have the humility to, to recognize that, hey, I'm slow now and that's okay. Right. Totally. <laughs> um, I want to talk about how we can build some of this outside of running meccas like Boulder, you know, like places like Flagstaff or Bend, Oregon, you know, San Francisco. Some of these major hotspots are just amazing environments for runners. You know, it's just like a playground, like you said. But not everyone lives here or has the ability to move to places like this. And, and I'm curious, you know, you mentioned soft hour earlier. And so I think right off the bat, I just want to encourage runners who want to build this kind of community, steal this idea, create a weekly group run that's at an easy effort. Everyone's welcome. And, you know, you just start bringing people together. Um, but I'm curious what some of what are some of your ideas for recreating some of the magic in Boulder without having boulder in your backyard yeah so there are a couple of fundamental pillars of this you need at least two people three is ideal and you need consistency and those are the two most important components right if you don't have consistency people don't know what to expect they don't know when to come back and if you don't have a second person or a third person it appears to be just like two people out for a jog which is fine but if you're looking to build community or a group the perception of it being a group is very important and so groups like november project grew through social media and there are a lot of takeaways from how to grow a community using social media one is sharing that you're doing this thing so not just doing it in irl um but you know, taking a photo and posting that you did it or sharing it on stories and and creating a, an expectation that you'll be there the next week at the same time, same place, it makes it very easy for people with similar schedules to, to do that. Um, and then just ask people. There, there are running stores that can help make those connections if you don't know any other local runners um strava and dorothy beal uh is a friend of mine who's um she's puts out a lot of good content on on instagram at mile posts but she's known for for strava uh recruiting you could say uh running friends and she she has created a lot of like real friendships through people who had flyby she, she had flybys with i think it's a little different for a woman doing this uh, to another woman or or a man versus a man, you know, creeping on Strava to a woman. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, but there are definitely ways to, to make those connections. And whether it's, you know, the person that you see out running the same time or same loop or same route as you, they're parking in the same parking lot, you pass them, you know, going the other way on a, on a consistent basis, or you're going to your local running store and asking, hey, I'm sure someone's been in here looking for running partners. What do you recommend? Ask a local race. Maybe they can send out a message about meeting for a group run or um, you know, a local gym. Maybe they can put out a flyer and, and you know, people can send you an email and, and you can link up that way. There, there are just so many ways to, to create this, but – Fundamentally, you need two other people and consistency and and a commitment that you'll do it on a regular basis. And so in the early days of November Project, the point that was hammered home was show up for a month and see what happens. If you go once, people might not notice you. If you go twice, people not might not notice you. If you go three times – they're going to start to notice that you're coming there regularly. If you if you go a fourth time, you've become a regular and you're like there's more of a chance that someone will engage if you're going to another group that's already been established, if you're looking to create a community in a new place or whatnot. But to me, it's that fourth time. Um and then the reality is that everyone is awkward, right? There are so few of the Matt Myers of the world who, or Marquise uh, Bowden who can just go up to anyone and talk. 
th- those people are are amazing and incredible. Um, Matt, you know, if if uh, he's been on your podcast, I recommend everyone goes back and listens to that episode. It was wonderful, very like nitty gritty fundamentals of of run training and and strength training. Um, but he's a community builder because he will go up to people. Marquis, same thing. They will go up to people and introduce themselves, welcome them, etc. That doesn't exist everywhere. The majority of people are awkward. They're uncomfortable, and they just want to blend in. <laughs> and so we're all so afraid and so in our own heads thinking about other people thinking that we're weird or we're awkward or whatever when everyone's just doing the same thing and feeling the same way. So – you can go up to someone or you can say, hello, I am, or you see someone that, you know, maybe you are a member of a group that's, that's showing up and you're showing up on a regular basis. Be that person, be the Marquise, be the Matt and welcome the new people and welcome the strangers. And maybe it will create something amazing for them. Oh, John, I think that's kind of beautiful. Um, Yes, let's start with Matt Meyer. He was in episode 268 of the podcast talking about his crazy high mileage. He's also just a really funny guy and, and like you said, is a community builder. I really like some of your ideas with like talking to the local running store or the, the local races that might be in your area because these, these entities are also looking to build community. And if you say to them, hey, I would love to start a group run, we can start outside of your running store, Uh, will you send an email out to your list or will you put a sign up in the store? They're going to do that because they want a running group to be hanging out right outside their store because it's probably going to improve their business. It's probably going to introduce more runners to their business. And it's like a win-win for everyone. One of the things I'm learning from you is like take a leadership role. Let's actually do some of this work yourself. And, you know, you speaking to the fact that if you're going to a group run, you got to go a bunch of times before it really becomes a thing. You know, it's like building any habit, right? You need to do it a bunch of times to sort of create that, that habit and that, that reward system. And I think a lot of us can learn from that and, and start creating the community ourselves through some of these leadership actions that we can take. Uh, plus, of course, you know, maybe it all starts on the Internet. You know, maybe it starts with going on Strava and searching for flybys, you know, or, or just noticing the people that you might see often when you're out there running. I know when I was living in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I was doing a ton of running in Rock Creek Park. There were a couple runners that I would see all the time, and and we ended up running together a bunch. And, you know, my friends thought it was weird. It's like, you know, Jason meets a lot of guys in the woods. (laughs) (laughs) Still true. Yeah, not something you normally do, but a great way to meet other trail runners, right? Actually out there on the trails. Uh, And those are some really tactical ways of building community is, is almost starting person by person. You know, who is that flyby with? Does totally. that person run here a lot? Can I reach out to them and see if they're available for a run? Um, you know, I, I just, I'm so passionate about this because not only was it the way in which I was introduced to the sport, so I, I very much experienced what this was like, but afterwards, you know, much later in my life, I sort of intellectually started learning that there's actually a lot of science and research behind this, you know, like I think studies show that people with whom you surround yourself by, they influence your performance by up to 30%. And this is like the people that you run with, but it's also, you know, the people that sit near you at work, you know, totally. like if you're near top performers, you're going to be better at your job. So two, so I think if- two things there first, before we leave the topic around, um, running stores or races being the anchor point of that sense of community. Also, you can do this with coffee shops. Call a coffee shop and ask if you can meet there. To your point there um, around the people that you surround yourself with contributing up to 30% uh, or detracting even more, um, my my desire to be intentional around this led to uh, – Laura Green making fun of me in an Instagram reel, <laughs> right? Like I, I am, I surround myself with, with people like this 
again, Olympians, professional athletes, et cetera, because I, I want to learn from them. And I find their process and the way that they handle themselves to be aspirational. And I want to surround myself with people who, you know, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm getting into another room. If I'm the fittest person in the room, I'm finding a new room. Um, and so being in Boulder makes that process really easy. Like, you know, I can hang out with a friend who's won Olympic gold medal. Um, that's, that's pretty unique. But again, that person is, is a normal human. Like she's very accessible to talk to, but her, her knowledge and the troubleshooting that she can help with and the, just like how these people experience life is so categorically different than the average person. And I want to emulate that. And I want to, I want to learn. And then the reason I have my podcast is so that I can share that. And so that I can take what I'm learning from these incredible people who I become friends with and have a discussion on a podcast like we're doing right now, where there are tangible takeaways and, you know, tens of thousands of people can learn from, you know, a, a conversation that sounds like it's happening on a couch or on a run or uh, at a bar, because that's basically the quality of the relationship that I get to have with these people. And, you know, there's the saying, you're the average of the five people you spend your the most amount of time with. And you should be really intentional with who those five people are. And we are so privileged in a place like Boulder where from an athletic and potentially also entrepreneurship standpoint, it's pretty easy to fill that five with pretty incredible people if you're intentional with it. I think you're bringing up a really special point because you know, a lot of times when people think about running with people who are faster than they are, it, it's about simply their speed or simply about their genetic ability or, oh, maybe they're a little bit better at getting up in the morning and you know, getting in their workout at that time. But it goes so far beyond that. It's really about their approach to the sport. It's about how they think about the sport. You know, like one of the things I try to do here on this podcast is, you know, get runners to have better mental models about training so that they can make better decisions about their training and ultimately become better runners. Right. And one of the best ways to do that is to go find those people who already have these really positive, productive mental models and try to emulate them. And, you know, looking back on my career, yes, I had better runners to do workouts with and all that, but when I was running cross country and track, it wasn't just about having runners next to me who were faster than me in a race. It was, it was just watching them execute the sport at a high level. That was so inspiring to me. You know, we talk about being process oriented and I think these really high level athletes are unbelievably process oriented to the, to the, to the point where, you know, you actually want to know why are you wearing those socks? You know, like you want to get down into the minutia because they have literally thought about all of these different things and they can introduce you to a new way of thinking about the sport that I think is, is uplifting, productive, and ultimately bleeds into every other aspect of your life, right? Because they're, they're talking about general health and nutrition and fueling and sleep quality and all these things are, that are not only going to benefit your running, but benefit every other area too. So totally, I think it's super important and highly impactful. So hot take. Um, I agree with that. And I think the back of the back of the pack also has a lot to teach us. Um, when you're out running a seven plus hour marathon, you have to know your why. I can't speak to this from experience personally, but I can speak to this from some of the conversations I've had with um, Martinez Evans, India Cook, um, others that you know are self-proclaimed back of the Packers. And um, these people have a special reason that pushes them forward when the water stations are shut down and, and the lights are off and the sun has gone down, you know, in the case of the New York City Marathon, for example, or even Boston, 
Um, there's a lot to be said for pushing forward when like the finish line is no longer giving out medals. Um, so while I completely agree that there's a lot to be learned from the professionals and how they do what they do, they're also genetically superior. Um, that's a component, but they're also really excellent at being good or consistent. Not great. They don't have to be great all the time, but they're excellent at being good. And so that's a physical component. That's potentially a mental component as well. But um, Peter Bromka said it best. He's like, fast people aren't always the most interesting people. Um, but it's it's you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's finishing dead DFL and isn't interesting or doesn't have a good reason as to why they're why they've finished that race. Um, those people are often harder to find, and they don't get the platform that um, you know the race winners get. But um, I'd also to those listening, like if if you see one of you know, someone like this on a podcast, listen to that podcast because those people have something to learn as well. I'm glad you brought this up because you're absolutely right. I think there's there's very interesting different lessons to learn from pretty much every runner you know like I, I know i focus a lot on uh elite runners just because they're at the top of the sport and you know i like studying their practices but the mindset of you know those self-proclaimed back of the packers is, is something that we can all learn from too totally i'm curious maybe we can talk about both groups a little bit more from you know these you know i, I keep i keep wanting to say back of the packer but you know i know it's a little bit uh potentially offensive you know a lot of these people are self-proclaimed back of the packers i mean it's a reality like you're either front middle or back like i, I don't know that it's offensive <laughs> it's just, yeah okay it's gotta be okay. categorized okay. somehow <laughs> for these people who describe themselves as back of the pack runners uh you've had a lot of interesting conversations with these folks and i'm wondering like are there any commonalities or um, you know, just things that you see repeated more often with these kinds of runners uh, as their big reason why they're doing this. Because like you said, a seven-hour marathon is difficult. You know, I don't know what's more difficult, a three-hour marathon or a seven-hour marathon. I've never been on my feet for that long. It sounds like I would need a nap halfway through. Uh, I think running faster would just be easier for me. So, it's definitely impressive in my mind in a certain way. And I just, I'm curious, what are some of these reasons that, you know, keep these runners going? Because I am impressed. Yeah. Um, for a lot of them, it seems to be that it's, it's, uh, they're proving to themselves that they can do it or they, there's some, someone has told them that they can't. And it's not about proving that person wrong. It's about proving themselves right. And so they've internalized the um, challenge to be productive and – and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, internally motivated? Maybe that's not the word, but um, – Intrinsically? Intrinsically motivated. motivated, yeah, versus extrinsically. Um, others, it's – they just love being outside, and they just happen to move slower. Um, and it's, it's you know less deep than we might, we might expect. And they're just like similar to how we covered, you know, 14 miles in two and a half hours last week. Um, that's, you know, that's as hard as we could push. And um, that's, you know, if it's a flat road, same thing. Um, so some of it's deep and motivation related and, and they love the process. They love the journey. They love putting one foot in front of another. Um, and others is just like, I like marathons and I'm slow <laughs> and it's just like, that's, that's, that's what it is. But, um, the podcast I did with India cook in particular, um, covers this aspect for a lot of them. It's, uh, and, and both India and Martinez Evans talked about how they want to be the runner that they wish they'd seen when they started running. So it's a representation thing, and it's it's a um, desire to show that there are, they can do it, and that you don't have to be the skinny person to or or a um, you know two fifty nine marathoner to have value in the running community. 
And so they're out there doing it so that someone can see them doing it and be motivated to do it themselves. I love that just participating in the sport for some people is an act of building community. Yeah. Because if you are a role model in that way, you are encouraging others to participate in the sport. You know, whether you're a woman, whether you're a back of the packer, whether, you know, your, your weight isn't the typical weight of, you know, your cliche runner. Uh, I think it's all very important to represent everyone so that everyone feels welcomed in the sport. I mean, look at what um, Kelly Roberts has done with her badass lady gang out of New York and now, I don't know, 10 other groups. And Kelly is an interesting one because she got her uh, internet notoriety from running the New York City half in like 2013 or something like that um, and and taking selfies with hot guys every mile. And that's what like <laughs> launched her, her social persona. And she, um, I basically harassed her to get to go to November Project New York. I was like, Kelly, you'll love this. Kelly, you'll love this. Kelly, you'll love this. Go, go, go. And she finally went. And I don't want to say I can take credit for all of her fame and fortune. I'm just kidding. Um, but as as things went on, she discovered the sense of, I guess, representation or not everyone looks like me kind of a thing. Similar to what Ali Kiefer has talked about as a professional runner. Um, and now she has people showing up, doing the sports bra squad and giving them confidence to live in the body they're in, etc. And that's very much a normalizing aspect of it where if you see yourself in someone else doing what you aspire to do, you're more likely to do it. And so to me, ultimately, that's the goal. Like, how do we get more people off the couch? America has a, a, a problem with or the world has a problem with being inactive. Um, there's some statistic that I don't know, some huge percentage of Americans don't get more than like 2000 steps a day. I can't imagine living my life in a way like that. And so to have someone who is helping people who need physical activity but don't look like everyone else doing it um that's that's aspirational or that's uh commendable yeah i think whether we're talking about you know maybe not even thinking about what it would be like to get less than 2000 steps a day or what it's like to you know never run with someone i think it's like once once you've seen the light you can't unsee right. it you, and then you want everyone this, to see the light. Yeah. And maybe this podcast is just a giant call to arms for runners everywhere to find running friends, get more involved in the community. If you don't have that community around you, take some steps to create one. They're actually not as difficult as you might think. You don't need some huge audience or platform to do it uh, because there's ways to, to do it on the internet. There's ways to get out there in real life and, and talk to local races and it doesn't matter who you are, what your ability is. Uh, I've just been really inspired by this conversation. And uh, I know you've already gone running today, John, but like, aren't you just jacked up to go for another run? <laughs> like, call up a bunch of people, go for, just do a workout. Jason, I don't, ready to run through a wall? I don't know that my legs could handle it. I ran uh, five <laughs> repeats up Chautauqua yesterday, and um, uh, my legs are worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad I got to chat with you. Usually our, our chats are in between labored breaths, climbing some technical trail on the front range. And uh, I'm usually more worried about tripping and falling on my face than trying to have a, a good conversation. So this was really fun. Well, I did most um, of that uh, last time. You, you, you caught me falling. I did. I got down. It on camera. <laughs> Is it on Instagram? Uh, yeah, I did put that on Instagram. I think you're, you're, what you said was don't die. And then I proceeded to trip <laughs> right next to a pretty big drop off. Yeah. On yeah, the trail. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't die. So I listened. Yeah, you did. You did. All right, man, this was super fun. Um, I, I know I was just on your podcast for the long run. Uh, but 
folks should definitely check out for the Long Run podcast, not just because I'm on it, just because you do a really great job of exploring some of these topics that I don't necessarily cover all the time here on the Strength Running podcast as we're focused a bit more on the training side of things. But there's so many other aspects of running that are super important, and, and you do such an excellent job of capturing that on your show. Um, do you want folks to come check you out anywhere else online? Yeah, first, um, thank you for the conversation that we had first today and uh, episode 264 on For the Long Run. Um, I got tons of feedback on that one, and you did as well, I know. Um, if you want to hear Jason the human versus Jason the podcaster and runner, um, this is a pretty good glimpse straight into his soul. Uh, not <laughs> oh, really God. not really uh, uh, embellishing much on that. Um, but to me, that's that's the point, right? Like we we are more than runners. We are humans first who happen to run and the the running experience enables us to process so many of the other components of our of our lives um so we had a pretty awesome conversation around uh the reality of life and ups and downs and emphasis on downs and then coming back up um in that one um we had just run a 5k time trial so we were a little loopy and depleted um, and in need of insert salt product here. <laughs> um, and uh, I could see this is your strategy, John. You get people all loopy from racing a time trial and then you ask them probing questions about their emotional state. I mean, it was one of the top episodes that I've had in, in recent months. So I, whatever it is, it worked. Um, but to answer your question, uh, yeah, I'm on social mostly Instagram at JW Levitt. Um, I like to tweet a lot, same, same handle JW Levitt. And, uh, the podcast is for the long run. And you were definitely using some euphemisms. So just to be clear with our audience on your show, I was talking about my divorce last year and how running helped me through it. So a lot of the downs and, uh, you know, life discussions were about that topic. So it's certainly uh, a little bit more Jason, the human being rather than Jason, the coach. Um, I will include links to your social media handles and your podcast in the show notes on strength running. Jonathan Levitt. Thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Of course. I'd ask what you're doing this weekend for a run, but unfortunately I'll be out of town so we can't run together, but appreciate the, <laughs> appreciate the, uh, the chat today and uh, we'll do it again soon, either recorded or right, not. Man. Sounds good. Take care.